Well, today we're going to look at another name for God, uh, tied with the name Jehovah, and we're going to look at a few of these names. And in the Hebrew, uh, it is called Jehovah Jireh. And we find this in uh, the uh, book of Genesis, chapter 22. It came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to Abraham, He said, Here I am. He said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, of which I shall tell you. Really. What a challenge Abraham faced here. But Abraham had walked with God. And because he had walked with God, he knew that God was faithful. Because he had walked with him and seen God's faithfulness, God's love, God's character, he was prepared to take these kinds of steps. He was willing to obey God because he knew that God was in control. He knew that God was not going to let him down. Now we know this because of the subsequent story and also because of what we understand from the book of Hebrews uh, when it comes to Abraham offering up his only son. And so um, we can see, uh, we're going to look at that in the book of Hebrews, but for now let's look a little deeper at the story and see what Abraham does. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. He split the wood for the burnt offering, arose and went to the place of which God had told him. And then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place far off. And Abraham said to his young man, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Now God had told Abraham, I'm telling you to go take your son and offer him up as a burnt offering on the top of a mountain. But Abraham said to his servants, he said, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. Abraham knew the faithfulness of God. He knew the faithfulness of God because God had made promises that from Isaac all the nations of the world would be blessed. And Abraham believed God. He believed God even in the face of what seemed to be impossibility because God told him to go and sacrifice his son. How far would Abraham go? So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. He took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Look, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. How far would Abraham go? My friend, this seems like such a strange story. It seems as if God is asking of the impossible. That God is telling Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. Your only son. The one whom is the heir of promise. The one who you have left with you because Ishmael is long gone now. I don't know what to do. Yes, Abraham knew what to do. He obeyed God. And in obeying God, he went all the way in that obedience. And here's what it actually tells us in the book of Hebrews. It says this, By faith Abraham, this is in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, that's what God was doing with Abraham. He was testing him. Not that God didn't know it was in Abraham's heart. He wanted it to come out in Abraham's life. When he was tested, he offered up Isaac, whom and he, he, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Abraham went up that mountain on the promise of God. Abraham said to his servants on the promise of God that a, a 
from Isaac all the nations would be blessed. And in Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding, it says here, that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, which he also received him in a figurative sense. In a figurative sense, Isaac was as good as dead because Abraham reached for the knife. But, but God. God was there. God was ready to give to Abraham what was needed to provide for him so that there wasn't any question as to the provision of God. And in this provision, we see the hand of God. And so when Abraham took the knife to slay his son, he would have went through with it, knowing that God would raise his son from the dead. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. I can't imagine a more relieved father at that moment to hear the Lord speaking, the messenger of God speaking. He said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for I know... Now know that you fear God, since you've not withheld your son, your only son, from me. You see, this was a messenger of the Lord. This was the Lord himself as well. Because he said, you, you did not withhold your, own, withhold your only son from me. So Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, and here's the literal word, Jehovah Jireh, or the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And then God gives even greater promises concerning his son Isaac. So in this story we see Abraham willing to obey God in the face of the most difficult challenge that any person could ever face in their lives. Now God of course did not want Abraham to literally kill his son. But what he did do was test Abraham that his faith would be tried in the midst of the deepest circumstance possible and come out shining. You see Abraham believed and trusted God. He trusted him so implicitly at this point that this is what he was willing to do. Abraham wasn't always there. He learned to trust God. He grew in his trust for God. He didn't perfectly obey God in the early days. When he was first called to leave Haran and go to the land of Canaan, he was told to leave behind his family, which he didn't do. He was told to go to the land of promise, Canaan, but he didn't. He went halfway to Haran, tied in with his father, Till his father died, he didn't make the move the rest of the way. And he took Lot with him, which God told him, leave your family behind. So Abraham had a lot of learning to do, but he did learn it. He learned to trust God. This tells us something, too, that God will not challenge you or put you in a place of challenge beyond what you are able to handle in the moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us this. There's no trial or temptation that will shall overcome you, that such as is common to man, but God is faithful to provide a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. God knows what you can handle, and he actually will put you in the position when you are able to handle it. And in this case, Abraham was put in the most trying position, but he discovered the faithfulness of God. And so, at the conclusion of this, when that ram in the thicket was there, and relieved Isaac was released from the altar and the ram was sacrificed in his place Abraham called it the top of the mountain he called that mountain Jehovah Jireh or the Lord will provide so when we consider this the Lord will provide is a name that he called it it's something interesting to think about he didn't call it the deepest trial. He didn't call it the hardest circumstance. He didn't call it the most noble sacrifice. He called it the Lord will provide. Because Abraham had already known by faith that God would provide. And God did provide. 
Abraham knew that he would provide a lamb. And he knew that even if he didn't, God would raise his son from the dead, according to Hebrews chapter 11. So what I want you to think about today in the name that Abraham called God, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider, that the Lord will provide, is that you can have the same confidence of Abraham that the Lord will provide. Will God you put you in the place of testing? Yes, he will. But the Lord will provide. Will you go through trials where it seems utterly impossible? Where everything has come to a screeching halt and we have no way that anything, there's no way forward here. The Lord will provide. Oh, my friend, Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Now, when we think about these terms being the Lord will provide, we want you to understand this is not... This is not the idea, the Lord will provide all the riches that you want whenever you want them. This is not what this means when it says, Jehovah Jireh, our provider. It means that if I walk in the will of God, and if I live in the way of God, I will experience the provision of God. This is what Jehovah Jireh means. That whatever God has for you to do as a task in your life, he will be your provider. You see, the Apostle Paul wrote of it in the book of Philippians, and he said, My God shall supply all your needs, in Philippians chapter 4, all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I know how to have nothing, and I know how to have things. He said that himself. And so he, he knew what it was to trust God as Abraham did. And know that the Lord would provide all that he needed for that situation. Hudson Taylor once said, who was a missionary to China, who relied on the Lord for provision in amazing ways. If you ever get a chance to read a book called Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret, I encourage you to read it. And you will see the wonderful provision of God in this man's life as he supported as hundreds of missionaries in China were supported by faith alone. He said this, God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply. Did you hear that? God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply. So our emphasis, and it should not be in Christianity, is an emphasis of constantly crying for money to people. Yes, we can let our needs be known, but not to make a to to look, act as if there is no God, so that we're constantly begging and crying for money to do God's work, but rather a place of prayer, and a place of trusting God, that He will be our provider, that God will open up and give whatever is needed exactly when it's needed. In this case, the ram wasn't needed until the time of sacrifice. The ram wasn't even there until the time of sacrifice. The ram was there the moment that Abraham was ready to sacrifice his son. God stepped in and provided. The Lord our provider. So when we look at this Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider, we then begin to see that it is for those who walk with God that they experience the provision of God in, for the work of God. For the glory of God. And not for personal selfish gain as the wealth, health and prosperity crowd would seek to promote. Instead of understanding, the focus is not on the provision, but it's on the Lord himself. Jehovah, the great I am, my provider. Wonderful. Wonderful passage of scripture to teach us these truths. Now, before you get into some radical idea that you're going to go out and do what Abraham did, stop and understand. You need to know God intimately when you uh, move forward to make decisions that would be as radical as this. But Abraham knew his God. He had walked with his God. He had seen the faithfulness of God. He had seen the fulfillment of promise after promise. And he knew that God was faithful and that God would provide. Praise the Lord for this wonderful reality. But not only Abraham has discovered the Lord's provision. I already mentioned Hudson Taylor. 
But I want to mention another man, George Mueller. And George Mueller was a man whom God called to open up orphanages. In England, back in the 1835s, um, George Mueller was convinced that God had called him to start an orphanage. And that was, there was, it was a devastating time for children. Orf, uh, orphans were on the streets, begging and dying. And George Mueller was filled with compassion, and he felt moved of God to do something about it. But he had no money. So what did he do? Did he have a big fundraising campaign? No, George Mueller knew what it was to ask of God. And so he announced his plans, yes, publicly. And the first gift that he received was one shilling, which is not very much. But the Lord sent other small monetary gifts, supplies and furniture and house and helpers, and soon the first orphanage was opened. Many more did open. He had thousands of children under his care. And often he had nothing to give them. There were times when they had no milk for breakfast. None. And they prayed. And the children watched George Mueller pray for provision while they sat there with the bowls in front of them and no milk. And then a knock comes at the door and a milkman comes along with a cart filled with milk and remember it had no refrigeration and he says I don't understand it but nobody wanted milk today I have all this milk that's going to go to waste can you use it this was an answer to prayer another incident it was a desperate time they had nothing left they were down to the last of what they had and George Mueller was sitting at a window, praying. And if I recall correctly, the mail had come and gone, and there was nothing in it. And he had nothing left except to cast himself on the mercy of Almighty God. And so he did. And what happened was, while he was praying, a delivery came. Someone brought an envelope. And as he opened the envelope, he tipped out the envelope, and there was a diamond. A diamond sufficient to pay for everything. This a woman had become convinced she had spent money selfishly, and she donated her jewelry for the orphanage to sell. So, it was even more than the diamond. Impressed, Mueller took one donated diamond, and on the window pane, where he was praying, he took that diamond and he scratched in the glass Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. My friends, the same God who provided in the day of Abraham, in the day of George Mueller, is still the Lord our provider today. Walk with God. Walk with Him in confidence. Trust in His provision for the moment. Do not trust in, in men. Do not trust in bank accounts. Trust in the living God. And you will discover Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. You will discover that the Apostle Paul could say in his day, My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The Lord is a great provider, friends. He will come through when it needs to happen. And my friend, I cannot help but speak of the Lord's provision in terms of our need. The need of the human race is great. We are not just in need of more finances for more things. We are not just in need of, of, of food for everyone on the planet. As a matter of fact, there is enough. There is enough. It's, it's, it's us that hinder that. What we are in need of most is the salvation of our souls. What we are in need of most 
is the forgiveness of our sins. What we are in need of most is to have the debt wiped out from us, a great debt of sin that will drag us into the very flames of hell. But, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider, what has he done? He has sent his only son to the cross. He has provided all that is needed for you to be saved. God has not looked upon your need and ignored you. He has not disturbed his back on humanity because of our sin. No, he has loved the human race. He has loved you that he so loved the world, that you, that he gave his one and only son. And he gave his son to be offered up in sacrifice. What Abraham did not have to go through at the last, the father did. There was no other lamb that could be sacrificed. There was nothing in the bushes that could be brought out to say, Stop, Jesus, you don't have to be crucified. No, the reason why is because Jesus himself was the Lord's provision. He was the sacrificial lamb. You are the one that deserved to be put to death. You are the one that deserves to be cut off from God for eternity. But Jesus took your place. God, in his mercy, allowed his son to be crucified so that you would be provided for. Jehovah Jireh. This was the greatest provision that has ever been offered to the human race. Sadly, there are many who do not accept it. There are many who turn away from the offering of God's Son and think that they will be okay. You will not be, because God has provided and you need to accept it. You know, we need to be humble enough to accept the provision of God in how he so chooses to do things. And sometimes our pride and vanity will keep us from it. Don't allow your pride or your vanity to keep you from humbling yourself and accepting God's provision in giving his only son to be sacrificed in your place. Jesus, the Lamb of God, has taken your place. He has become the atoning sacrifice for sins. Jehovah Jireh. And so my friends, if you want to think about God, you must think about this great I Am, this one with all power and authority, this great Elohim, who in all of his wisdom and might and power created the universe, and who stands apart from it in time and space, and is filled with all this rulership, and yet, who is intimately our provider, in giving us all that we need. And that's what the scriptures actually teach. Again, saying that not only did Paul write about how my God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory, but the word of God actually tells us that God has given us everything that we need for life and for godliness. It's incredible. He has given us all that we need. And so, when we discover that reality, we can uh, give God the glory and know that He is truly our provider. He will give us everything that we need for life and for godliness. Praise God that we had that promise. We also have this one in Philippians chapter 1. He says, I am confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So, we have Jehovah Jireh. If you're a Christian, oh, you should be dancing with joy. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. His grace is sufficient for me. Now, didn't Paul say in his deep trial in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he writes about being in a deep trial. He writes about um, really being at the end of his himself and beseeching the Lord three times and God saying, No, Paul, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm not going to bring healing 
in this situation, but my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. I am Jehovah Jireh. I'm your provider. That's literally what he was saying to the Apostle Paul. Paul, I'm not going to do things your way. But I'm going to meet your need. And so it is for even those who have been martyred. Even though they were not delivered from the sword. God provided. We already saw that as we looked at the encounter that Stephen had with Jesus, the Lord, our provider. Can I encourage you, maybe in a fresh way, to believe God's promises? And maybe you're going through a trial and you're wondering, how's it going to turn out? Don't forget the Lord, our provider, Jehovah Jireh. Amen. Here's a little song uh, written by Don Moen, actually, and it's called Jehovah Jireh, My Provider. Jaira, my provider, His grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jaira, my provider, His grace is sufficient for me. My God shall supply all my needs according to His riches in glory. He shall give His angels charge over me, Jehovah Jireh cares for me, for me, for me, Jehovah Jireh cares for me, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, His grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, His grace is sufficient for me. Shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. He shall give his angels charge over.